I'd also like to give a special thanks to the Smithsonian American Women's History Initiative and the Brick Companies for supporting this project, as well as the Anne Arundel County Public Library Foundation for their generous support of the Anne Arundel County Public Library. All right, please also feel free to share your questions, any questions you have for our presenters in the Q&A box. We'll have some time to answer questions at the end of the program. Um, our CERC scientist, Allison, will also be responding to some of your questions during the program. Now, I'd like to introduce our presenters for the program today, Jilly and Katrina. Hi. Hi, everyone. My name is Jilly Jutz, and I'm an educator at the Smithsonian Environmental Research Center, also known as CERC. Um, thank you all so much. Thank you to Joanna and the Anne Arundel County Public Library System for having us. And thank you all so much for joining us. It's, break, it's breaking my heart to see, to not see everybody right now. I wish we were in person, but I'm so happy that everyone can make this. 105 of us, wow, can make it uh, virtually. So we're really excited to be here. And I am equally as excited to introduce you all to, um, oh, before I introduce you to Katrina, um, let me tell you a little bit about CERC. So again, the Smithsonian Environmental Research Center, we're part of the Smithsonian family, um, and we, but we're not a museum. We're a research center devoted to, of course, environmental science. Um, and uh, we're located in Anne Arundel County. Uh, we're down in Edgewater, Maryland, um, right along the Road River. So for those of you outside of this area, we are about one hour east of Washington, D.C., and one hour south of Baltimore. So yeah, and at CERC, we have over 20 different labs studying some of the most important environmental issues like invasive species, land use, fisheries, and climate change. Um, and uh, our mission is to provide science-based knowledge to find solutions for the environmental challenges of today and the future through research and education. Uh, yeah, so now I'm very excited to introduce one of our fantastic scientists, Dr. Katrina Lohan. So Katrina, welcome, and can you please introduce yourself? Hi, Julie. I'm so excited to be here today. My name is Dr. Katrina Lohan. I run the Marine Disease Ecology Lab here at the Smithsonian Environmental Research Center. And as you can see, I am actually broadcasting live from inside my lab today. Okay, cool. Yay. Thank you so much, Katrina, for joining us. Um, okay, so let's get started. So this activity is all about, and this whole program is all about DNA. The DNA, I'm sure you all have heard of it. Lots of people talk about it. When you hear the word DNA, you probably imagine that double helix, this little stuffed animal DNA, I don't know if you can see, but the double helix shape, the DNA. Um, but what exactly is it? So it stands for a big fancy, very big word. Um, oh my goodness, D-O, D-O, well, Katrina, can you please help me? What does DNA stand for? It is a really big word, Jilly, <laughs> and it's really hard to say. <laughs> Deoxyribonucleic acid. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you. Yeah, so that's a big word, and it's, DNA is basically a molecule. It's a really, really important molecule that's found in every single cell in every living thing. So every living thing has DNA, dogs, trees, grass, and people, all of us. Okay, so Katrina, I'm gonna test your DNA expertise. So I'm ready. are you ready for this? Yeah, let's do okay. it. So does this marker have DNA? No. No, that okay, marker okay, no DNA. Does, um, let me see, my face mask. Does my face mask have DNA? Well, if you were wearing it, it might have some of your DNA that came off on it, but the mask itself does not have DNA. Okay. Um, how about this plum? Does this plum yes. have DNA? That plum does have DNA in it. Okay, so the plum, even though the plum has been picked off the tree and it's no longer growing, I guess technically no longer alive, it still has DNA. That's correct. Even things that were once alive but are not alive anymore, still have DNA in them. Though it's important to know that that DNA would get into smaller and smaller pieces over time until it eventually broke down into the single nucleotides. Okay. All right, so this is kind of a trick, but I think you could do this. Does the model of DNA have DNA? No, no, <laughs> it doesn't. 
Aw, but it's super cute, right? It's so cute. Look at the eyes. <laughs> okay, and then last, does this packet of applesauce have DNA? This is kind of a trick question, Jelly, because the applesauce inside it has DNA, but the container that surrounds the applesauce is not. Okay, excellent, because surprise, this is what we're gonna be extracting DNA from. <laughs> so it's probably good to find out if it has DNA in it before we get started. <laughs> okay, so going back to what DNA is and the idea that every living thing has DNA, every living thing has DNA, but no, but we all don't have the same DNA. DNA makes us who we are. Um, you know, some people think of DNA like instructions, instructions that tell all of our different cells um, what to do at having, you know, it guides them to do all of the different crazy tasks that all the cells in our bodies do that make us who we are. So anything from the color of our eyes to how tall we are, to some of our behaviors, it all comes down to DNA. And in a way, DNA is kind of like a barcode. So if you're in, let's, I'll use my plum again. You know, when you're in the grocery store and you get your fruit or any other item and you have the, all the little bars, this is a barcode. So when you take it to the register and you scan it, the system knows exactly what this is, how many there are in the store, uh, how much it costs, maybe even like where it's from. So it has all this information and DNA is kind of like the same thing, but you don't see people and animals and trees walking around with barcodes on their butts. So how do you get the barcodes? How do you get the DNA from something and read it? So you can understand what it is, what it's about, all of that. So scientists use a lot of different, they do a lot of different things to extract the DNA. You first have to get that DNA before you can actually read it. So that brings us to our activity and why you all are here today. So. Our activity is a great example of how, like what we're gonna be doing with the activity is we're going to be taking the DNA out of the cells of the applesauce. So Katrina, how many cells are in the apple, this applesauce? Ooh, I can't give you an exact number, Jilly, but let's just go with a lot, <laughs> like a lot, a lot. Okay, so that means there's a lot of DNA in this, right? Yes, so every cell has one um, copy of every piece of DNA in it. And so the more cells you have, then the more copies of that DNA that you have. So if there's a lot, a lot of cells, then you have a lot, a lot of DNA. Okay, awesome. That's gonna make this really great. Um, okay, all right, so let's get, let's get started. And Katrina, Katrina's gonna be joining us doing this as well. So K Katrina, are you, are you ready for this? I am, Julie. I'm a little bit nervous because I followed a lot of protocols like this and I do a lot of cooking at my house. So this is kind of like following a recipe, but I've never done this one before. So I'm hoping that I can follow your instructions really well because this does not look exactly like what we would do um, to extract DNA from, I, I work on mostly animals and not plants. So it looks a little bit different, um, but Science is all about trying new things, so I'm ready. Okay, excellent. Let's do this together. Okay. All right, so the first, the first few things that you should always do before starting any type of scientific experiment or baking any cake, doing anything with the recipe is you wanna make sure that you have your instructions on hand. And again, for those of you that don't have the instructions with you, you can go online, I think there's some there's some behind the scenes educators who can put the, put the link on, in the chat um, and then you can follow along with these instructions. Uh, and we're gonna be using the materials that we provided in, those, in the kits. So if you have a kit, if you're able to pick up a kit from the library, that's awesome. You can, you can do this with us. If you don't have a kit and you weren't able to find the materials, just watch, you know, watch, and then you can always do this again later. We're going to be recording this. Well, we are recording this, and we're going to be making it available to everyone. So you can always watch this later and do it again with us later. Um, yeah. Okay. All right. So we've got our we've got our instructions, um, and we also need to go over safety. Safety is very important. 
with everything. So with this specific our safety sheet, with this specific experiment, we're going to be using rubbing alcohol, which can be it can be dangerous. So make sure that after you're done this, um, make sure you close the alcohol. Yeah, thank you, Katrina. There's our, our rubbing alcohol. Make sure you close it nice and tight and store it in a cool and dry place. Um, also, make sure you wash your hands. Really wash your hands after this uh, and um, make sure you really remove the rubbing alcohol if you get it on your hands. You shouldn't, but just in case. And last, very important, do not drink the rubbing alcohol. It will not taste good. It won't feel good. So don't, don't drink it. Um, yeah, and if you have any questions, definitely refer to the safety sheet or put any questions in the chat. All right, so I have another camera that I want to turn on. This is an activity. It's labeled our activity camera. So you can all see my hand. I know this, this can be a little jarring. <laughs> so I've got two cameras on. One's on my face and one is on my hand. So you can see my workspace and you'll be able to see a little bit easier um, what I'm doing. All right, so again, we've got our instructions. It's really important to have those next to you. We're gonna be walking through them. And then again, your safe, the safety sheet. So the last thing we need to do before we can officially get started is make sure you have all of the materials. So Katrina, do you have your kit? I got my kit, Jilly. Let's go through and see if you have all the materials. Okay, I'm gonna start pulling stuff out, ready? Yeah. All right. I have a packet of applesauce. Ooh, this is apple mango, go, go, squeeze. These are my two daughters. They love these. Oh my gosh, this is so good. Okay, so I got applesauce. I have a green spoon that has a, a big side and a little side. I have, ooh, I got shampoo. So a tiny bottle of shampoo. And then I have a, another small snack size bag that has salt, coffee filters, Q, oh, those aren't Q-tips. They are um, toothpicks okay. and a small plastic cup. Okay. Oh, and then I also, well, okay. So then I, I also grabbed water in this beaker um, because Julie told me to earlier. <laughs> and I also have rubbing alcohol that did come in my kit, but I already put it on ice. So this is just a giant plastic container with ice um, that I put my alcohol in because um, I don't have a freezer right now. Okay, awesome. Thank you for that, cool. So looking at our instructions, you have everything, which is great. And we can, we can get started. Uh, for those of you following along at home and you don't have shampoo, dish soap works very well. Dish soap is great. So that's a good substitute for that. Um, yeah, okay, cool. So step one, we need to place the rubbing alcohol in the freezer or in an ice bath. So like Katrina said, we, we both don't have a freezer next to us. So we both have ice baths. Um, so if you guys wanna take a moment to quickly run and put your rubbing alcohol in the freezer and then come back. And I'll wait a couple seconds for everyone. And Katrina, while, while we're waiting, why, why do we need to put the rubbing alcohol in the freezer? Why does it need to be cold? Well, it doesn't have to be cold, um, but it works better if it is cold. Um, so um, it's just a way of helping to um, pull the DNA out at the end, which is what we use the alcohol for. Okay, cool. That makes sense. Um, okay, all right, so let's, let's do this. So the next step is while we're wait, while we're you know after we put the rubbing alcohol in the freezer, we're going to use the teaspoon and into the plastic bag, teaspoon and plastic bag. We're gonna first put. Let's start with the water. One scoop of water. Wait, wait, Jilly. Yeah. So so my spoon has two sides. One says one tbsp and one says one tfp. So which side am I using for the scooping? That's a great question. You're gonna use the one TSP. So the TSP stands for teaspoon. So the, that's the little one. Perfect. Okay, so. How many 
many scoops again, Katrina? Was it was it two? Uh, so the protocol says one scoop of water. Okay, one scoop. All right, so I got one scoop of water. Okay, I put it in my bag. Okay, excellent. So the next thing is- I'm gonna my bag up a little bit here, Jilly. Otherwise it's gonna like spill water all over the table. So I got it propped up against my cup here. Oh my gosh, and it's not like we have a hundred people 120 people watching us. I know, no pressure, right? Okay. okay. <laughs> applesauce. So the recipe says three scoops of applesauce. So here we go. So is that is that the big side or the small side for that one too? Um, oh, that's a good question again. Okay, so it still says using a teaspoon at the top of it. So I'm guessing that one scoop always means one teaspoon. Okay, that makes sense. Um, to that's what the recipe says. So I'm going to do one teaspoon counting out loud so that I don't forget. I do this all the time in the lab too. <laughs> Two teaspoons. And three teaspoons. Oh my gosh, I wanna eat the applesauce. Good. <laughs> well, you know what? After this, when you're all done and cleaned up, you can eat the applesauce. Ooh, I'm gonna close this up so that I can eat it later. I also can't yeah. eat in the lab, so that's a good thing. I have to, I have to take the applesauce out of the lab because there's lots of chemicals in here. You can't eat when there's lots of chemicals. Okay, yeah. I got my water yes. and my applesauce. Next is one scoop, so one teaspoon. Again, the little side of shampoo. Okay, I got my shampoo. Katrina, when you woke up this morning, did you think that you would be mixing shampoo and applesauce? You know, I did. <laughs> oh, I need to get a little bit more out. Come on. Oh, there we go. Okay. I completely filled my teaspoon. All right. All right. Mm -hmm. Oh, it's so goofy. Kind of hard to get off the spoon. <laughs> The last thing is a pinch of salt. Okay. Oh. I got my little salt packet. What if I just pour the whole thing in? You think that'll be enough? I think, I don't know, actually. This is always the hardest in the recipe. I never know how much is a, is a pinch. Pinch. But I feel like, what if you, what if you put the whole thing in? And what if I just put, what if I just put half? And we can see what happens. That's a good idea. Okay, I'm going to put the whole thing in. We'll see what happens. Okay. I'm only going to do half. One of my favorite things about science, you get to try new things and just kind of figure out what works. Okay, I got right. everything in my bag. Yes, so... Wait, really quick, why? Well, actually, you know what? Let's do the next thing and I have a question about this and we can I can ask it while we're doing it. Okay. So make sure you close, close your bag nice and tight. And then what you're gonna do is exactly what you really want to do, which is smush this. <laughs> smush it all up. Watch all the bubbles. So as we're smushing, Katrina, why why shampoo? What is that? What exactly does the shampoo do? Are, are we getting DNA out of the shampoo too? No. So um, so every cell has this sort of wall around it that keeps all the different parts of the cell inside the cell. And one of the things that's inside the cell is the DNA. So you have to be able to break open the outside of each cell in order to get the DNA out into the solution so that you can see it. So soap, that's what it does. So soap will actually break open that, um, that cell wall and release the DNA. And so that's why we're putting soap in here with us. And then we're using both the chemicals in the soap as well as the mechanical aspect of our hands to be able to break those cells open. Hence the mashing part. <laughs> cool. Oh my gosh. Okay, so I think we need some sound effects then. That's my sound of breaking cells apart. <laughs> oh, I did something wrong because now I have soap all over my hands too, but that's okay. My hands are really clean. Okay, I feel like that's pretty good. This is what mine looks like. I've got some bubbles. I got lots of bubbles. Yeah. Okay, great. So let's. Let's do the next step, which is, okay, this is like the, I think this is, this is the tricky part, but we can all do this. So we've got two coffee filters. I'm gonna open them up. And then grab your cup, a little experiment cup, 
And this is gonna look kind of funny, but take this, the center of the coffee filters and put it in a cup like this. And then what I like to do is kind of like move this around so that I can place the cup down. You can hold it just like that. So with your other hand, grab your mixture if we can balance. <laughs> And what you're gonna do is you're gonna pour the mixture on top of the filter in, in the cup. So what's gonna happen, I'm gonna move this up down so you can see the side of the cup. What's gonna happen is when the mixture is sitting on top of the coffee filter over the, over the inside of the cup, it's gonna filter. I mean, this is, that's how, what a coffee filter does. You know, all of the, the liquid will come and then will drip through and then that's what we'll have at the bottom. And what's gonna be left is any of like the, you know, any like solid gross stuff that might be in, well, it's not gross, but any solid stuff that might be in the applesauce. Um, yeah, so I'm, looks like Katrina's already done it. Ooh, yeah, I like that. really funny. I like what you did. So what you did, instead of moving it around, you kind of made it like a cone. I did make it like a cone. That that's really smart. I like that. So here's your cone. I'm gonna try that too. Yeah, so I just kind of folded the edges a little bit, if you can see like on top, so that it fit like a cone inside. And then I can just see it dripping out the bottom. See? Oh great. I feel like I'm making coffee. I love coffee. It's so good. <laughs> okay, cool. So did you did you squeeze the bag to get everything out? Or did I you just did. Do it? I, I think I did pretty good. See? Oh yeah, that's pretty good. Oh God, okay, I gotta keep up. All right, I think that's pretty good for me too. I'm gonna put that aside. So I'm not gonna turn mine, I, I'm gonna bring mine to my other camera so you can also see, you see it dripping. So this might, we, we wanna give this a few minutes. So let's put that aside. I'm gonna turn my, that separate camera off. And then, oh. I'll turn that off. And while we're waiting for that to finish filtering through, um, Katrina, I've got some more questions for you about how you study and how you study DNA. So when you're in the lab doing your work, is this how you extract DNA too? Um, there, are, there are parts of this that are the same, but um, we are very careful about um, not getting our own DNA in the samples and also not about mixing DNA from one sample to another. So we make a couple of tweaks um, and I will show you some of the, the stuff that we use. So when I come into the lab to extract DNA from tissue, um, the very first thing that I do is clean my space and put on gloves. And that is because, um, well, you have DNA on your hands from yourself. And so you want to make sure that your DNA does not get into your samples. Um, at the same time, that oily stuff on the bottom of your hands um, is part of your body's way of um, getting, helping you to not get sick. And so some of those oils will actually also destroy DNA. So we wanna keep them from getting into our samples. Um, and then finally, the, the soap that we use is like super, super, super strong soap. So if we were to get it on our skin, it can like cause a rash and a lot of irritation. So we wanna protect our hands from the chemicals that we're using. Okay, so Katrina, so when you're normally in the lab, you wear gloves for three reasons. One is to prevent your DNA from getting in your sample. Uh, the second one is to um, protect the DNA because the oils on our hands could destroy the DNA yep. from our sample, wow, okay. And then the third reason is to protect our own hands from the chemicals that we're using. That's right. Okay, cool. So for our activity here, should we have been wearing gloves? Well, so the chemicals that we're using are um, for this DNA extraction are not as strong as what we use when we are doing this um, for scientific purposes. So um, it's okay. I mean, you use shampoo on your hair and you use bare hands all the time and it doesn't hurt your skin. So um, it's just what we're using in the lab is, is a different kind of soap. And that's why we have to use gloves. Gotcha. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Um, so we also use a lot smaller amounts. So I will put all of the ingredients that I need to extract DNA in this teeny tiny little tube. 
So we use really <laughs> small volumes and that's because we were talking about every cell has DNA. So it doesn't take a large amount of tissue from any kind of animal to get enough DNA to be able to learn about it. Um, and then I have a handy dandy tray that is made just to fit these teeny tiny little tubes. I also have special tools like these forceps, um, which are actually just like tiny tongs. So you can use them to grab small pieces of things. And I have special metal scissors. And it's really important that these things are metal because one of the ways that we prevent DNA moving from one sample to another is that we use um, a special kind of um, tool that we can actually have a flame. So there's a fire here. And then we will flame sterilize each of our um, uh, utensils in between samples so that we can't transfer DNA from one sample to another. Um, so then the last thing that I normally have in my space is, oh wait, I always have a pen because every time you're doing anything in a science lab, you have to be able to have pen and paper so you can take lots and lots of notes, not only to remind yourself of what you did, but one of the things in science that's really important is being able to follow the same recipe over and over and over again and be able to repeat your results. So being able to take notes about what you did is really important. And then I generally have some kind of outline of the animal um, that I'm taking tissue from. So fish is one of the animals that we extract DNA from. And this is just um, an anatomy sketch showing me where all the different parts of the fish are so that I can make sure that I find the right part of the fish that I'm looking for to get the DNA out of. And then once I have all of my tube in the tray full of the tiny amounts of DNA, I then take it from this lab and I go upstairs to a different lab to continue the extraction process. So what you're seeing in this other camera image is actually our DNA extraction room at the Smithsonian Environmental Research Center. And so all of those tiny tubes fit into this machine here. So this is actually an incubator. What it does is it'll actually change temperatures. So one of the ways that we get uh, DNA out of cells is to um, put these chemicals together. So all the really strong soap into one tube with the tissue, and then we heat it up. And being, by increasing the amount of heat, you can actually make the process go faster and make, the, um, make it stronger so that you can actually break open all the cells um, and get as much DNA out as possible. If you're talking about an organism that has a really, really strong cell wall, so for instance, plants actually have a really strong cell wall. Um, there's also certain um, like single-celled animals that live in um, the water column. Well. I'll call them animals for ease, but technically they're, they're single cell dinoflagellates. Um, they can have like armor on the outside of them. So this is a machine called a tissue lizer, and you can actually put metal beads into these tubes and then it goes back and forth really, really fast and it will actually use the metal tubes to actually beat up the tissue. And then once we have all of the cells have been lysed, which means they've been broken open, we will then take those and put them into this big machine on the end which is called a, um, a biosprint. So this is our biosprint, which will actually um, extract DNA from 96 samples at a time. So we can do this for a lot of samples at once. Um, and it will purify them as well, which is the process we're going through now. So removing all the other components of the cell so that what you have left is just the DNA. Um, and it will do that for 96 samples um, pretty quick. If we're doing less samples, so we don't have as many um, because we just have less samples for the project, um, then we will just use this machine that's on the other side of the lab, which is just a small centrifuge. And so that actually just helps, um, rather than, than this process we're doing right now of waiting till everything passes through the filter, you can put your tiny food in the centrifuge and it spins really, really fast, which forces all the material through the filter. Oh, wow. Oh, that's very cool. So the first two machines that you uh, you showed us, those that were breaking down the cells, that was kind of like like when we were squishing our sample, mechanically okay. squishing it. That's so cool. Yeah. That's very cool. Do you have a favorite one of those machines? Um, I really like quickly extracting from 96 samples at a time. So I got to say the big machine is probably my favorite. <laughs> we generally process um hundreds and hundreds of samples for a single project because it takes a lot of samples to be able to answer some of the big questions in ecology that we have 
So it could take a long time if you had to only do those 24 at a time, which is the maximum number you can put into the smaller machine. Wow. Okay, cool. All right. I think I'm ready to check out our sample. I'm getting so excited. Okay. So let's, let's check out our sample. Um, so it's still dripping. Is the next step, let me put my, put my activity camera back on. All right, so go ahead and take, take off, the, take away the, um, your filter. So Julie, are you squeezing the bottom of the filter or are you just? You know, I'm not actually sure. When I practiced this before, I tried it once squeezing it and once without. What do you think? Why don't I squeeze and you don't? Okay, I like okay. that. You have gloves on and I don't, so I think that that probably is better. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, that's right. I left my gloves on. It's <laughs> I always wear gloves in the lab. It's just, it's a totally natural feeling for me. I realize that's not true for, for most people who are not used to wearing gloves, but yeah, <laughs> I didn't even notice I still had them on. <laughs> okay. So you can okay. go ahead and, oh, I should have said this before, but that's okay. If you haven't, go run and quickly grab your alcohol from the freezer or the ice bath. And while we're waiting for everyone to do that, for those of you who are still here, um, it's up to you if you want to try if you want to squeeze the um, your filter or if you want to try try it without. And you know, definitely do this again. Definitely try this again and try 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 your methods a little bit differently. You know, if you're trying like you're going to squeeze it now, try don't you know next time you do it, don't do it, and compare your results. See how it looks different. Um, okay. This is, really, this is why you need to take notes. Because if you take really good notes each time you change something, then you can have notes to be able to go back and compare and see what exactly changed over time. You won't have to just rely on your memory. You'll have it all written down. That makes, that makes so much sense, which is why I'm not taking notes right now. <laughs> um, okay, all right, so let's, let's do the last step. Oh, this is so exciting. So with your alcohol, go ahead and unscrew it. And then what we're going to do is we're going to pour the alcohol and don't pour yet. Don't pour yet. We're going to put the alcohol in the cup, but because alcohol and water, which is the main, you know, the main ingredient here, it, because they're two different densities, if we just pour it, like very quickly pour it in, it's going to mix and we're going to have to wait for it to settle. So instead of doing that, if you can gently pour the alcohol along the rim so that it really gently goes into your mixture. So hopefully the layers will form pretty quickly and we don't have to wait for it to settle. Ah, how are you doing Katrina? I think I did pretty good. Okay, yeah, oh yeah. Okay. Yay, okay. So I didn't use all of it though. I guess I should pour some more. All okay. right. Oh, I think I see some layers. So I'm going to turn off my activity camera and move it to my regular one so that you can see the side. Ooh, I see fuzzies. Yay. All right. So this is what my sample looks like right now. How about you, Katrina? What does yours look like? Looks okay. like yours. It looks really similar. Ooh, okay. So why don't we wait a couple, why don't we wait a couple of minutes and we can come back? And that's totally fine. If your sample, if it we're gonna be, we wanna wait until there's three very distinct layers. And if your sample looks like this, also totally like that's totally fine. If you wait a little bit longer, eventually, you know, uh, you know, just a couple minutes and those three layers will, will start to form. Some of you might already have the three layers, which means you are way gentler pourers than us. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, so let's, let's wait, let's wait a couple minutes and we'll come back to it. And for those of you who even, you know, after the end of the program, you're still waiting and you still don't see the three layers. It is fine. It's totally fine. Just come back and try again. Um, and maybe definitely take notes like what Katrina was saying, see where, how you did things differently and maybe try something different. Okay, and that also reminds me if at home, if you're using a different type of shampoo than this, that also might change your results. 
if you don't have this exact shampoo that we have in the kits, I would just suggest uh, using dish soap. There's so many different types of shampoos that have some different ingredients that might change the results, but most dish soaps are pretty, are pretty standard. So that also might be the case if you're not seeing the three layers. All right, I feel like I talked more than I was expecting. So I kind of want to check the sample again. How does yours look, Katrina? I feel like I could still use some more time on mine. Yeah, I mean, I can definitely see the white squigglies, but um, it's a little bit hard to see, Julie, because since the alcohol was cold, it's like causing frost on my cup. Oh, gotcha. Oh, wow. All right. Frost is not the right term, but it's clouded. <laughs> so, all right. Let's, well, Katrina, what layers? Ooh, but Julie, looking straight down, I definitely see the white squigglies. Oh, yeah. Let me turn this other camera back on and see what we can see on my sample. I'll try it first. Okay, like that. Yeah, can you see it? I think I, I think I can. Let me see what it looks like. Does that make a difference, Katrina? With the black background? The black background is a little bit better. Yeah. It's kind of hard to see in your sample, Julie. Okay. Yeah. Oh. Well, but I definitely see it in my cup. So I see what look like mm, kind of like cobwebs on top of the applesauce layer. They're just fine white little lines. And that is the DNA. Okay, so let me let me show you. So let's pretend we do have the three layers and I've I'm starting to see like a little bit of one on mine. It's really, it's really faint and you might not be able to see it at home, but normally what you would see, and if you wait a few more minutes, we'll probably be able to see it, but this um, opaque orangey layer, this really thin layer in the middle, you can see where my pinky is. Um, it's kind of milky. It it's starting to look like cobwebs a bit. And then what's this top layer, Katrina? So that's the alcohol you poured in. Okay, so where would the DNA be? The DNA is in the middle. So those white squiggly cobweb looking lines, that's the DNA. And then that bottom layer, Jilly, is basically everything else from the applesauce cells that were small enough to fit through the coffee filter, um, but that are not actually the DNA from those cells. So there's lots and lots of different things that are inside cells um, that we call like the machines inside cells that do all the work. Um, that basically the DNA and has the barcodes to create those different machines. And so some of them are really small and that's what you get in that bottom layer there. Gotcha. Okay, cool. So for everyone, for everyone at home, what you can do next is use your toothpick. And maybe this will shake things up on mine. And you can kind of start to go into that that second middle layer where Katrina said the DNA was, and you kind of start picking up like this, and you might see some of those cobwebs. I see really, really little bit in mine. So try to look at it from the side like I'm doing right now, but you might also be able to see it more clearly if you look from above. It's cool, Jilly. You can like move the cobwebs around and scoop them up with your toothpick. Oh, that's so cool. So, oh my gosh, it looks kind of like a streamer. Oh, that's so much fun. So this is the DNA. Yeah. Wow, so how come how come the DNA doesn't look like, like our DNA stuff with that? How come you can't see that helix? Right, so that helix is actually so small that no one has ever actually seen the helix. We know what the helix looks like and the shape of it from a whole bunch of different experiments that people have done over time to figure out what the structure of DNA is, but it's not actually visible. So instead, um, what you end up with here is, um, you know, inside cells, DNA is like, it's really jumbled together. It's like, it's really close. There's a lot of tight knit DNA like on top of each other. Um, and so what you end up with in an extraction like this is all of that DNA that comes out that's still kind of tightly wound together. 
So imagine like a million of those helixes combined and wrapped around in lots of different ways on top of each other that create those cobwebs. Wow. Oh my gosh. Okay. That's a lot. Well, that makes sense. So we did it. Yay. We did it. it. Woohoo. I'm giving you, Katrina, a high five. I'm giving all 123 of you high fives. Yay. Good job. <laughs> um, wow. Okay. That was awesome. But that did, you know, that took a little bit of time and being all your equipment, this, I mean, this looks like a lot of work to Right. So we would have called that one sample. Well, so Remember this, I talked about doing this for hundreds of samples. That's crazy. That's a ton of work. So why do you do it? Like, why, why would you even do this? What, I mean, yeah, what, go for it. Why do you do this? Um, well, so I do this for a lot of different reasons. Um, when I was little, I really wanted to be a marine biologist. And one of the reasons I wanted to be a marine biologist was because I was fascinated by all these creatures that live underwater because it's not a place that I can live, right? So I can hold my breath and go underwater and visit those creatures. Um, but in doing that, it's, it's really hard to be able to learn lots of different things about them. And so with DNA, we can use their DNA instead to learn about um, who they are, what they're doing, who their parents are and their grandparents are, what other animals they're more closely related to, even how they move around the world. Um, there's lots of different things you can use DNA for. And we even use DNA for animals that we don't want to disturb. So you can get DNA out of parts of animals um, that they kind of leave behind. And that way we don't have to actually catch animals um, and we can just leave them alone. So when you're talking about animals where there's not very many of them left, we call them threatened or endangered species. Um, we can learn about, we can use their DNA to learn about them, but, but we don't have to touch them and we can leave them alone so that they can um, hopefully get to a point where they're no longer threatened or endangered. That's so cool. That's really cool. So you said that you can get DNA from the things that they leave behind. What do you mean? Well, one of the things that we extract DNA out of is poop. <laughs> so when you're talking about the DNA that's actually in poop, the, the poop contains DNA from the animal that left the poop behind. It can also tell us about what that animal has eaten because everything that they ate that passed through the digestive tract and came out in their poop will also have DNA in it. So we can learn a lot about like what animals are in the ecosystem with them, how much of each different kind of animal they're eating, how their eating might change over time, either across a day, across weeks, across seasons, depending on which different animals are available for them to consume. And then the DNA from them, we can actually use that DNA to identify who they are like to an individual level. We can track who their parents are and put together like family trees to see what different animals are around. Um, and we can even use it to um, tell, you know, what, uh, compare them like across really broad scales. So like use the poop from an animal in Maryland and compare it to the poop from an animal in California and see how closely related they are. That's so cool. That's really cool. So wait, really quick. Is that actually poop that you're holding? What is that? It is not. It is, um, it is a poop stuff animal. And yes, I do have a poop stuff animal. <laughs> so do you only use poop to get DNA? Um, we don't, we, um, we actually get a lot of DNA from animals um, from directly from their tissues. So um, I um, have done a lot of work studying oysters. And so the, um, you can use, use the oyster and, and break open the shells and take tissue from inside. Um, and you can do that from, um, different kinds of bivalves too. So like mussels, again, if you open up the shell and you take part of the tissue that's inside, um, do the same thing from fish. So the part of the fish that you actually eat is from the mussel. Um, but we usually go for things like the stomach because it will tell us about what the fish has been eating. Um, we can use muscle tissue. It kind of depends on what research question you're asking as to which body part we take which is why these diagrams are so important to make sure that you take the right body part to answer the question that you're interested in addressing. Um, so what, what research questions are you interested in? What do you study? So I actually study a lot about um, 
what animals are eating um, because I'm interested in how, um, how you could think about like energy like moves through a system. So if you think about energy as like calories, right? So our body has to burn calories and we use that as energy. Um, we can look at how that um, different, different components of food webs can actually move through from the top to the bottom, or sorry, from the bottom to the top. I'm going, I'm gonna go that direction instead. Um, so you can look at from like the, the, the single tiny animals um, that are then eaten by like shrimp, and then the shrimp are eaten by fish, and then the little fish are eaten by bigger fish, and then the big fish are eaten by, say, river otters. Um, and then I will take DNA from the poop of the river otter, and then we can actually look at um, how, what, what the river otter has eaten um, and what's actually passed through the system to get to the river otter at the top. Okay, I'm following along. So you said, so I wanna draw what you mean by a food web. Oh, yes. All right, so shrimp eat what we call phytoplankton. So, um, and actually zooplankton. So think teeny tiny plants and animals that are single cell that are virtually floating in the water column. Okay. And then small fish will eat the shrimp. Oh. Okay, so if shrimp are eating the phytoplankton, then let's say, so you say the fish, oops, didn't do that in front of a hundred people. Fish, okay, what eats the fish? A bigger fish. A big fish. Okay. Or a crab. Okay. <laughs> And then those big fish or crabs then get eaten in, at least in the Chesapeake Bay. I don't know where these hundred people are, but in the Chesapeake Bay, they can get eaten by river otters. Okay. I feel like my arrows, maybe this will make it more clear. But you're saying that the energy is actually going in this direction, from the phytoplankton, from the shrimp, from the fish, big fish, all the way to otters. Okay, gotcha. So how does, studying oh, sorry, go ahead. Oh, I just said we get energy out of the food that we eat. Okay, cool. So, and you're saying that when you're studying DNA, you're able to understand the food web even more? Yeah. Okay, cool. So because yeah, you- so When we take, when we actually take like the, um, the insides of the stomach, we can look and see like what animal, what has been eaten, what's inside the stomach. And for those animals where we can't actually get their stomachs, we use their poop instead. And then we can use the poop to tell us what it is they eat. Gotcha, that's so cool. That's really cool. Um, okay, so what other, what other kinds of organisms are you looking at? Wow, so we look at shrimp, we look at snails, um, we look at poop from river otters, um, we look at a couple different species of fish, big ones and small ones. So we do like striped bass and summer flounder. We also look at little mama chugs. Um, so we look at smaller fish too. Um, I've also looked at a whole bunch of different kinds of bivalves. So those are the um, like oysters that have two cups, um, uh, mussels, a couple different kinds of clams, um, lots of different things. Okay, awesome. Very cool. Um, so. I want to know, I guess, a little bit more about you too, um, because what you said, like what you do, it sounds a lot of, it sounds like a ton of fun. So why, I mean, to me, I got into science because I find it really fun and just hearing you talk about it is really fun. But why did you decide to go into science? So I decided to go into science because I really like learning and I really like solving mysteries. So for me, the scientific process of having this question and being able to come up with really cool, creative ways to be able to answer that question and then, and then getting an answer with your data um, was something that I always thought was a lot of fun. So I really enjoy doing that. And it's always very interesting to me how, how even the answer then leads to more questions. So it's a constant process of getting to learn new things. It's also really fun because as the scientist who gets to analyze the data, I'm the first person to be able to see the answer because it comes up as I'm, as I'm looking at the data. Um, so it's kind of cool to be able to say like, I was the first person to be able to see that, you know, 
these are the animals that are being eaten by river otters, just as an example. Very cool. Yeah, that, that definitely makes a lot of sense. Those are, I mean, for those of you who don't know, Katrina Lillian, her, her title, and please correct me if I'm wrong, you are a principal investigator, right? I am a principal investigator, yes. It means you're the head of your lab. And um, I love that whenever I hear principal investigator, I just imagine you with like a magnifying glass and like a detective hat. So it's funny that that is one of the reasons why you're interested in science. Um, okay, all right, well, great. And so with our last, with our last 10, 10 minutes, there's a ton of questions from all of our participants. So uh, let's spend the last, the last bit of this program going through them. That sounds great. Okay. And I think- I right, really go. Uh, I think Joanna, did you? Was yeah, I'll go ahead and ask you guys one of the questions. So one of the ones that I think was just answered, but I think would be really interesting for you guys to share a little more about is how long is DNA? How long is DNA? So um, that is not a simple question to answer. And <laughs> it's mainly because um, it varies by organism. So if you think about, if you think about DNA as, as making up chromosomes, right? So we know that humans have 23 pairs of chromosomes um, and the different chromosomes are different sizes, but then you have different animals that have different numbers of chromosomes too. Um, and each of those is a different length of DNA. So, so it becomes a, um, there you go, chromosomes. Uh, so, so it actually varies a lot. And I, to jump in, I, I, uh, what I was always told was that for humans, uh, one strand of our DNA was so long that if you stretched it out, it could go from the earth to the sun back and forth uh, 20 times, I think. If, if anyone knows if that's correct, please put, it, please put it in the chat. But either way, that's really long. <laughs> Okay, Joanna, any other All questions? All right, yeah. So we have another question asking how long you've been a scientist. Julie, how long have you been a scientist? <laughs> uh, well, hmm, that's a great question. Uh, I feel like I've been a scientist since I was um, in the 12th grade. That was the first time I ever felt like a scientist when I did my, my first research project. Um, where I was investigating something and um, I was actually investigating something about the Chesapeake Bay. And that's the first time I felt like I was a scientist and that was at least 10 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> that's quite, uh, I feel like that sometimes is a hard question to answer because I feel like anyone can be a scientist as long as they are, are asking a question and, and coming up with a way of um, you know, going through the process to answer a question. Um, but I, I suppose on a more technical note, um, so I went, to, uh, I went to college. So I, I, went, I got an undergraduate degree and then I went to graduate school two times. So I, um, I have a master's of science and then I took a year off to work and then I went back and got a PhD. Um, and so I received my PhD in 2011. Um, so I've been working, um, you know, as a, as a doctorate in science since then. Awesome. So we've got another question. Why is the DNA so small? So DNA has to be really small because it takes up a really small component of a cell, right? So within one cell, you have to be able to have all the different parts that can keep all the different functions that a single cell has to do going at the same time. So DNA actually has a really tricky job where it has to be able to code for all of those different um, jobs, but be um, wrapped up tight enough that it's in a small enough space that it allows enough room for all of the machines that it can create to do their job within a cell. Awesome. So then Truth and Elijah would like to know, has there been any animal that you've studied with mutations that increased their chance of survival? And if so, what were the changes? That is a great question. I will say actually in my research, I don't look at genetic mutations. Um, 
I use changes in DNA to figure out how different animals are related to each other. So from that standpoint, they are technically mutations, um, but they're not the type of mutations that you're talking about that um, that actually would would allow an animal to do better or worse in a certain type of environment. Awesome. So then we had another question. Does all food have DNA? I'm going to pause for a second and think about that. It should. Yes, it should. Um, if you drink filtered water, it might not have DNA. And that's really important to do because we are mostly water. <laughs> but the filtering process probably takes out a lot of the DNA. Um, but all of the animals and fruits and vegetables that you eat have DNA in them. And so, so and when you're saying water, water, Katrina, you mean like the like the little organisms that could be living in the water, it would eat their DNA in the water. So filtered water would take away all of that. Right. So if I were to go out to the Road River, which is right outside of Surf, and I were to take a cup and take a sample of water that water would contain lots of different tiny microscopic animals in it that would have DNA, right? But the water that you drink at home, that water that, that gets removed from some sort of bay like this one goes through lots of different filtering before it gets to your sink um, or to the bottle of water that you're drinking. And so that's, that's why I meant that um, it probably doesn't have uh, DNA in it um, by the time you're drinking it. Un unless you're like water skiing and, and drinking water from the bay or you went swimming and accidentally took a gulp. So then another question somebody asked was, what can we use instead of applesauce to extract DNA? Right, so um, if you carved up a pumpkin for Halloween, you could uh, take a chunk of that pumpkin and extract pumpkin DNA. Um, if you have bananas or strawberries at your house, um, basically any kind of fruit that you can mash up, that would be good too. Um, I wouldn't do some of the, like if, I, like sweet potatoes, other potatoes might be kind of hard just because they're so strong. So being able to break them up would be more difficult. Um, but a lot of the softer fruits um, and some of the softer vegetables, like maybe the inside of zucchini, you could extract DNA from those. Awesome, so we've got one more question. If I eat all different kinds of food, what would I get, or would I get all of its DNA in my DNA? No. So um, I was actually thinking about, I, I was thinking the answer was gonna end with poop and then my answer was gonna <laughs> be yes. But um, so, <laughs> so if you eat lots of different foods, um, that DNA does not become incorporated into your DNA. Um, but it will pass through your digestive tract. And if we were to get a sample of your poop, not that I'm recommending that we do that, but in, in your poop would have all of the DNA from all the things that you ate. Um, so we would be able to see it that way. That is so awesome. And I know I said that was the last question, but I do have one more that I think will be really fun. And then I think it might be time for us to wrap up. What is the largest single cell organism you've come across while looking for DNA? Ooh, the largest single cell organism. Oh, it's probably, it's probably some kind of um, phytoplankton. So some of the phytoplankton can be pretty big. Um, so those like dinoflagellates I was talking about earlier, they can get to be a pretty good size. Um, most of the things you can see with the microscope have multiple cells. There's a couple of um, like seaweeds or, um, or fungi where they can have single cells that are really big. Um, but yeah, uh, I do a lot of actually like DNA extractions from the water column. And we use the DNA then to figure out like what's what's just in the water that we would take from a bay sample. Um, so we've definitely gotten DNA out of all kinds of stuff from inside the water. That is so cool. And thank you, Jilly and Katrina, for such a wonderful program today. I also wanna thank all of our participants who are able to join us. I think it's just about time for us to wrap up. Please feel free to check out our website for more events for all ages and have a great day, everyone.
Thank you, everybody. It was awesome to be here with you guys. Yeah, thank you so much. This was a lot of fun.